our speakers from California, so we thank them very much for getting up so early. So this is Anish Manohar and Elizabeth Jenkins, who are going, I think Anish is doing first the present part of the presentation. They are going to talk to us about gauge invariance and minimal coupling, and in particular on the uh, subject of H22 gamma. So from San Diego, they have, uh, okay, you can start, go ahead Anish, I think uh, you know more or less um, that it's time I see somebody asking a question. Uh, I will warn you, okay, and um, and I will interrupt, uh, etc. Okay, so please go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, and welcome everyone. So, um, so I was going to discuss uh, some issues with Higgs to gamma gamma, and then uh, some stuff on gauge invariance and minimum. So I'm going to first talk on the physics of H to gamma gamma, and then we'll go on to the gauge invariance and minimal coupling problem. Okay, so the references are here. So the paper we started was uh, in January, and then uh, there was a follow-up by, by the uh, Barcelona group, which is down here at the bottom, and then, uh, so in response to that, Elizabeth uh, and I and Mike Trott wrote a paper having to do with the issues gauge invariance and minimal coupling and an exactly soluble large end model related to H to gamma gamma is the is the third reference. Okay. So just a quick summary of where we are, which is that even before the LHC, at least since I've been working on deep physics, the precision results on electroweak measurements and on flavor physics to rare B decays, which is B2S gamma showed that the standard model was working extremely well. And in particular, like in B2S gamma, Mishiak and collaborators had done an amazing for loop calculation uh, with theory errors less than 10% or so. And the, and the experimental and the theory rates were basically in agreement. And there were many models which used to predict, they don't predict anymore, but they used to predict that these rare BDKs would occur at rates of sometimes several hundred times the standard model rate because they didn't have this gym structure. And now we know, at least in the flavor physics sector, that the standard model works very well, and CKM unitarity works extremely well as well. Uh, and uh, so that's why people now study models with just minimal flavor violation because that's essentially a way of in introducing gym into the standard, into new physics model. So the only untested sector was electroweak symmetry breaking. And even there, through indirect fits, we sort of knew that, well, at least they indicated that a light Higgs was the most favored possibility. So now we have some LHC results of 7 and 8 TeV. And as far as I can tell. Louder, either close to. OK. Louder as as voice, as, either. As as I, no, no, I'll put the mic no, closer. No, I'll put the mic closer. OK. Track from our experimentalists, there's no rumors they're chasing. Everything seems to agree with the standard model. We have a particle with a mass around 125, 126 GeV. Looks like it's a scalar positive parity. And its production and branching ratios are consistent with the standard model, but right now they're pretty big error bars. So let's say within a factor of two, everything works. And there's really no evidence for any new particles, et cetera, at least up to, depends on the exact theory you're using and the exact spectrum and details, but you know, maybe around 1 TeV, maybe 800 GeV, maybe 2 TeV, depending on exactly what you're looking at. So at around 125 GeV or around you know, a few hundred GeV, the standard model, including a fundamental scalar, seems to be a good description of what's going on. And so if you want to understand how well the standard model is working, whether there's a deviation from it or not, then we can do the standard sort of analysis that people have done in the past, like the precision electroweak, which is just write down the most general effective theory, put in some higher dimension operators, see how well you can constrain them. And if all the coefficients are very small, then the standard model works, or you know, maybe you'll see some deviation. And so the assumption which we're going to make is essentially that the standard model feels 
including a Higgs doublet, are the correct variables to use in a Lagrangian, at least at a few hundred GeV. And that the effects of new physics can be put into higher dimension operators. This wouldn't work if there were extra light particles around, but experimentally that seems not to be, light meaning around the Higgs mass, but that seems not to be the case. Now, as soon as you put in higher dimension operators, we already know there are neutrino operators, which are dimension five related to seesaw and possibly baryon violating operators from the gut physics, but those scales are too high to affect anything with the Higgs. Uh, and so we're really looking at therefore dimension six operators with some scale, which is around, well, we'll take it to be around a TeV. If it's uh, much heavier than that, higher than that, then the effects of new physics are not going to be observable at the LHC. So basically one, somewhere around a TeV, it's low enough that you can see something and it's high enough that you wouldn't predict uh, new particles have already been seen. Okay, so now this is just a quick summary. You don't need to read everything. I can't read everything in my screen resolution, but all the possible dimension six operators in the standard model were classified by, originally by Duke Mueller and Wheeler. And uh, recently, uh, the first reference has redone the analysis and they found some extra field redefinitions to remove a few redundant operators. So they have a slightly smaller basis. They've classified them into various quantities of groups. The ones we want, okay, uh, are this column here, this on the bottom left, which have two Higgs fields and two gauge bosons. Most of the operators, so these other two columns on the next page, have a whole bunch of fermions in there, and there are some barrier number violating operators. But Anyway, there are 59 operators which conserve baryon number plus these five which violate baryon number. And field redefinitions have been used to eliminate uh, redundant operators. Okay, so in general, the effect of Lagrangian is the standard model plus by assumption some all these dimension six operators with some coefficients and scale lambda. Really, it's only C over lambda squared which comes in, but it's kind of useful to think of lambda as being a TV and Cs as being order one. And so there are a lot of terms, uh, 59 independent coefficients, and that's too complicated to really do anything, it's especially given the very limited data right now. So what we did was we looked at those operators in that in the basis uh, on the basis of 59, which contribute to Higgs production, that is glue glue to Higgs and Higgs to gamma gamma at tree level. And so because this is going to come up later, I'm going to define what I mean by tree level. And what I'm going to mean is I'm taking this Lagrangian at the top and calculating using the Feynman rules of this Lagrangian. So what I mean by tree level is tree level computed using the effective theory Lagrangian, treating these extra coefficients as just coupling constants in uh, L effective field theory. The so the operators which do what I'm what I said is are the six or eight down here. Placing the gauge one of the gauge fields by the duo. The first column here uh, is uh, CP conserving, and the second column is CP violating. There's a constraint on, okay, let, maybe we should go over them. One of them is gluon squared, one's B mu nu squared, one's W mu nu squared, and there's an interesting WB operator which has one SU2 field and one B mu nu field, and you have an H dagger tau AH on the left so that this thing is gauge invariant. The WB operator contributes to the S parameter, and the relation between the two is given by this formula over here. Now, because of uh, gamma Z mixing, the combinations of those coefficients which couple to the gamma and Z are, are listed below. So you can just plug in and rewrite B and W in terms of Z and photon, and you find that the Higgs to gamma gamma rate is proportional to the W plus B operators minus WB. And for gamma Z, it's this combination here. And I'll define similar things for the dual 
and uh, so the amplitude is Higgs goes to gamma gamma, it goes to F mu nu squared with the coefficient C gamma gamma, and it goes to FF dual with the coefficient C twiddle gamma gamma, et cetera. Okay. So if you calculate the rate of Higgs to gamma gamma in the normalization I've given you, then the rate is relative to the standard model one minus this new coefficient squared plus the gap the tilde, tilde coefficient squared and the first term the uh, standard model Higgs is Higgs goes to F squared so the C amplitude can interfere with the standard model but the C twiddle amplitude which is CP violating cannot so it has the structure here and really therefore the important term is just the C term because it can interfere with the standard model the sec the C twiddle term comes in as a 1 over lambda to the fourth rather than 1 over lambda squared. And there are similar expressions for blue blue to Higgs and Higgs to gamma z, et cetera. So what we did was uh, we were looking at the renormalization group running of the operators and we looked at the basis of operators that we wrote down, which is just a sub matrix of the full 59 by 59 matrix. And there's obvious reasons for this. We didn't want to go calculate the 59 by 59 anomalous dimension matrix. And these operators are the ones which are the, you know, given the dominant decay rates. And also, I had worked on an earlier model with Mark Wise, where, uh, with octet scalars, where which basically these operators I wrote down were exactly what that model produced. So, uh, I'd already looked at some things related to this earlier. Okay, so now. Anomalous dimensions of these operators are related to the UV structure of the theory and they can be computed directly in the unbroken theory. You could compute them in the broken theory or the unbroken theory and you get exactly the same anomalous dimensions. And in the standard model, people have done this and looked at the running of various, uh, just the Lagrangian itself up to like two or three loop order and verified this. Now what's interesting here is that the anomalous dimensions also depend on the lambda phi fourth coupling and the top quark Yukawa coupling. And in some ways, the top quark Yukawa coupling is actually the dominant contribution. So we'll get to that. Um, because these operators have gauge field strength squared, uh, the uh, there's an interesting set of non-renormalization theorems which come in. One is that you know from the trace anomaly that beta of g over g times f mu nu squared is not renormalized, so it has no anomalous dimension. And you know from the fact that g squared ff dual is a topological term that g squared ff dual is not renormalized. And what this implies is that if you just go to one loop order, which is what we're working at, and again, one loop means one loop using the effective theory Lagrangian. G squared FF dual is not renormalized, and the beta function over here, which starts at order G cubed, tells me that G squared F squared is not renormalized. The only subtlety is in the trace anomaly, it's the sum of this, the trace anomaly is the sum of beta F squared over all three gauge groups, but at one loop order, the mix, the, there's no mixing between the various contributions. So individually, G squared F squared over for the QCD, the SC2, and the U1 are separately not renormalized. So that provides a check on the, on the results. So here are the diagrams from the Higgs uh, gauge operators. And if you just delete the Higgs lines, so look at the middle block. If you erase all the Higgs lines, these are exactly the diagrams you would compute for the renormalization of just F squared. And so you can verify when you, that when you add up all of these diagrams, you get zero. So that's like a check on, on what we're saying from the non-renormalization theorem. And the other interesting thing is that these diagrams have a very different structure depending on whether I'm looking at F squared or FF dual because the vertex, one of them has an epsilon symbol and so a lot of terms drop out. And, but nevertheless, even though the individual pieces are different, when you add them all up, uh, they have to cancel. So that provides some check that our individual diagrams are right. And so what you find is the following structure. The gluon operator runs by itself. The three weak, electroweak operators run with an anomalous dimension. And the structure of the anomalous dimension is, is given down here. But the interesting thing is, are the lambda terms, which are the lambda phi fourth coupling, and the capital Y term, which is essentially uh, 
three times the top quark Yukawa's coupling squared. And where do these come from? Well, the lambda phi four terms come from the diagram up here. And it doesn't look like there's a top quark Yukawa anywhere in the diagrams, but it comes in through the wave function renormalization of the Higgs field. So that's why the y terms are diagonal and everything has the same uh, 2y factor. And the twiddle anomalous dimensions happen at one loop to be exactly the same. And we have an argument in the paper as to why that must be the case. So that's another check on the calculation. But it's not expect it's not going to hold at high orders. Now, because the largest running is from the Yukawa coupling and it's diagonal, we can introduce a, a function which is defined basically as the running mu dd mu of r of mu is the Yukawa anomalous dimension. And what's going to enter is ratios of r at different scales, so the overall normalization is irrelevant. So we just picked it to be 1 at the Higgs mass. And here's what the plot looks like of this function. And the thing to note is that at, a, at about a TeV, it's about 6, 7 percent or something like that of the running. So if you scale out a factor of, maybe I'll go back here. If you scale out that factor of R, that's equivalent to dropping these diagonal 2Y terms in all the Cs. The remaining anomalous dimension is actually a lot small, is smaller than this Y term, and you can approximate it by just the one loop running. So we use the following approximation in the paper. You can actually do, do the whole thing. And for our plots, we did it numerically. But you can understand what's going on pretty well by just writing the coefficients as this ratio of r's from the Yukawa coupling and then integrating the rest of the anomalous dimension just perturbatively uh, as 1 minus the anomalous dimension times the log of lambda over mh. So this is the relation between the couplings at the high scale and the couplings at m higgs. And if you look individually at things like what contributes to gamma gamma or gamma z by just taking those equations and taking those equations. Anish? Yeah. Anish, a hand raised. Yeah. Okay. So let me turn off. Hello there. Um, just a first question. What is R? Uh, you want to know what R is? So R is exactly the solution of this RGE equation, which has been put in just to take care of the top quark Yukawa coupling. So I, if I define the function this way, so this is just a definition, then what that means is that if I define all of my C's as C multiplied by R, as a, as a C prime multiplied by R, then the running of C prime is the same matrix but with the, without the 2Y term. So it's like solving the equation in two steps. The, y, the solution of the effect of 2y on the RGE is just multiplying by this r factor, and then everything else can be integrated. Because it's diagonal, I can, I can do it that way. That, that's all. It's just a way of solving the equation. So it's nothing fundamental, but it, it's a nice way of doing it. OK. OK, so now if you look at the s parameter, the RGE improved s parameter depends on uh, CWB at a light scale, and so we get the following combination here. And people have computed the log lambda dependence of CWB earlier uh, just by explicitly inserting these same operators and doing diagrams, and they did this in the broken theory. And the expression is given down here. And so this is done a different way. It's done by computing the finite parts of graphs in the broken theory and looking at the log lambda term, we did it by running coefficients. But they have to agree, and they don't. And so we're trying to sort this out. But if you look at the two expressions, you can see that the CWB minus the 1 over 8 pi squared, the bottom terms, are given by, by our formula here. 
by the second line of our formula, but they clearly do not have this R factor, that is, they, they do not have a contribution from the top quark, and they're also not having this first term here. So we're trying to sort it out, out, but some of the diagrams that we have which contribute are not given in this finite part of the calculation, and it has to be that the two agree. So we, we'd like to check and make sure that we understand what's going on. Just to show sort of roughly what's going on, what we did was we know that the gamma gamma rate, which depends on the gamma gamma coefficient of the Higgs mass, is going to be from the running depend on these CW, CB, and CWB at the high scale. One linear. Sorry, can you guys hear? Continue. Something has happened, but... Uh, we, we hear you. Can you talk? Yeah, can you hear now? Do you hear me? You somehow crashed. Okay. That's all. I'll try not to click the mouse or something. The. Uh, okay. So we have these three parameters of the high scale, and so Higgs to gamma gamma at the low scale is some linear combination of them. Another linear combination, the one on the uh, over here, determines the S parameter. And so if you go through the algebra and just work for linear order, you find that the gamma gamma rate, so mu gamma gamma up here is just the ratio of the Higgs to gamma gamma relative to the standard model, is 1 plus something which depends on the S parameter plus this unknown C gamma gamma coefficient at a high scale. So there's some non-trivial constraints in here because you know that S is constrained, et cetera. But it's not so simple because, because of the renormalization group, the coefficients mix with each other. So if you wanted to constrain S, you might think, okay, I'm just going to set CWB at the high scale to zero. But that's not good enough because if you set it to zero, you still generate a CWB at the low scale through this off-diagonal term in the mixing matrix. And just to see how important these effects are, it's a little hard to see, but here, is the contribution to the S parameter assuming CWB at the high scale, which is, uh, is zero, and just looking at how much you get from CW, and this is the contribution just from CB and as a function of the scale lambda. So if you're at around a TeV, even if you set CWB to zero, you're getting a order 0.05 or so con contributions to the S parameter, assuming that CW or CB is order one. If they happen to be two, for example, uh, then you would get a number of point, you know, it would be double. But this is comparable to the current experimental bound on S, which is around 
So it affects the analysis of constraints on these parameters. Okay. Um, let, let me not go over the stuff. The numbers have changed since we wrote our paper. This is from our paper. But basically, you can see from here that if you're trying to explain mu gamma gammas, of which are of order one different from the standard model, the ratio of two or something, it's going to be really hard to do this with all of the constraints. But, but if the deviations from the standard model are of order 10% or 15% or something, that's com com comparable to the size of effects we're looking at here. And then the RGE analysis will change, you know, when you put constraints on the parameters and make ellipses or whatever, it's going to change where they lie because the effects are comparable to that. Okay, so now let's get to minimal coupling. And so there was a paper claiming that some very basic, well, some very strong claims actually, which is that you can't just use any of the op operator basis for doing this kind of higher dimension operator analysis and then effective theory. And in fact, they have one specific basis and they say you have to use that and it, nothing else is right. Uh, and the other thing, which at least I had never seen before, is the claim was that there's a very general classification of effective theory coefficients, and you can say that certain Cs are tree, and certain Cs are loop, and furthermore, the things which you classify as loop have 16 pi squared suppressions. And in addition, uh, this paper and some earlier papers on which it's based claim there's something which is called the principle of minimal coupling, which defines a way to classify effective theory operators. And you can classify some operators as consistent with minimal coupling or are minimally coupled, and others violate min minimal coupling. And those which violate minimal coupling have suppressions by loop factors, again, of order 1 over 16 pi squared. So I just want to discuss generally the issue of gauge invariance and minimal coupling. And so we don't get confused. Okay, so what is minimal coupling? So people use this sometimes when they're teaching field theory or quantum mechanics. And what it means is that if you take a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian with no gauge fields in it, it has some derivatives in there. And what you do is you replace the ordinary derivative by the covariant derivative. So wherever you see a little d in the Lagrangian, you make this replacement, and that constructs the gauge theory. Okay. So let me first just summarize what people know, what, pe what is usually done in effective field theory. For example, if you're doing chiral perturbation theory or heavy quark effective theory or soft collinear effective theory or uh, NRQCD, you assume there's some scale of new physics. You write down your effective Lagrangian. It has all possible Lorentz invariant local operators, which are also gauge invariant. Dimension five operators have a one over lambda. Dimension six has one over lambda squared, et cetera. There's some subtleties with multiple scales. So in the standard model, you can have you know, leptogenesis scale lambda nu, or you can have a gut scale lambda g, et cetera. But for us, we're just going to look at new physics due to a sing some uh, interactions at a single scale lambda, which is about 1 TeV. The analog of lambda in heavy quark effective theory would be the heavy quark mass. In chiral perturbation theory, it's lambda chi, which is somewhere around the rho mass or 1 GeV or something like this. OK. Now, just to summarize, the effective theory can be, the reason we use the effective theory is we can actually do calculations with it. And the reason you can do that is it's an expansion in a small parameter. So the theory does not have to be perturbative, but nevertheless, there is a small parameter you can expand in. So for example, HQET, you expand in the coupling constant of the heavy quark uh, mass, and you expand in non-perturbative effects, which are power series in lambda QCD over MQ. If you're doing chiral perturbation theory, you have a similar expansion in derivatives. There's a momentum expansion in P over lambda chi, and you can, ex even though the dynamics is in some sense non-perturbative, you're talking about hadrons, the chiral Lagrangian can be used in perturbation theory, and your expansion parameter is a momentum expansion. So you're talking about terms at order P squared, P fourth, et cetera. 
And when I talk about tree and loop, I will always mean tree and loop as, as referring to perturbative diagrams which are actually being calculated using the Lagrangian up here. And the coefficients in the effect of Lagrangian are not assigned any tree or loop number. And remember that the reason we use the effective theory is because we don't always know the theory at lambda, or it makes certain calculations a lot easier. If you're given any specific theory, then the coefficients ci have a certain value. So if you knew the theory, then you would be able to calculate the coefficients. In HQET, we can actually calculate the coefficients. But in chiral perturbation theory, uh, in principle, you could. But in practice, you cannot, because uh, they're non-perturbative. Uh, the matching is non-perturbative. If the theory is weakly coupled, then of course you can calculate the CIs, but in some sense you don't even need to bother with effective theories then because it's perturbative. You just go ahead and calculate everything and that's not a problem. And so for the Higgs case, the reason people are using the effective theory is you want a model independent way of analyzing the results without putting in your prejudice about or prior knowledge about what the high energy theory is because at present we don't really know what, what it is. Now, some information from the high energy theory can be put into the effective theory. So we often assume, okay, the high energy physics is CP conserving or it's lepton number conserving and then we put those constraints on the effective theory. And that's really coming from symmetries. And the reason we can do that is symmetries apply certain ward identities or certain relations among S matrix elements, and the effective theory has the same S matrix elements as the original theory you constructed that way. And so the ward identities of the original theory imply relations in the effective theory, which can be, uh, which therefore imply that the operators conserve the same symmetry, preserve the same symmetries. Okay, so this is standard stuff, and we all know that we can use symmetries to constrain the effective theory. And the basic point is, which has been known actually for a long, long time, is that minimal coupling is just not a symmetry. And therefore, it does not imply constraints on the effective theory. And there are many, many, many ways to see it. And so we'll go through them. And furthermore, let me just say one thing, which is I'm not going to bother with people who claim wild speculations about the effective theory without any calculation. So for example, I could just say, I have a theory. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm just going to assume it solves the hierarchy problem and is a 126 GeV Higgs particle. As far as I'm concerned, that's not a solution to anything. You've just assumed the answer. And similarly, you could speculate that, you know, I have a technicolor model with a small s parameter and a light scalar, and it's possible that there's such a thing, but it's really up to the people making the claims to show that they, such a thing exists. And so, uh, as you'll see, assuming that the effective theory is minimally coupled is really not any different from any of these assumptions. It's not something you can actually do in the same sense as, say, uh, assuming CP in the low energy theory from CP in the high energy theory. You're making wild assumptions about the dynamics, and there's really no way to show that that's true. And in fact, there are many examples which show that those assumptions are inconsistent. OK, so let's start with minimal coupling. So if you, so here's the replacement of an ordinary derivative with a covariant derivative in, an, uh, in QED. There's a factor of the electric charge of the particle in front. In a non-abelian gauge theory, it's important to remember that this mu in here is really mu ATA, and the TAs are representation matrices in whatever uh, representation the particles are. And I'm going to call it the minimal coupling prescription rather than principle because it, you'll see it's not a principle. Uh, so what, an, what, do, what is meant by non-minimally coupled terms? Well, an example is an anomalous magnetic moment operator, sigma mu nu f mu nu, because if you take the theory without gauge fields, this thing's not there. I mean, because f mu nu is zero, and so you can't get it by a, replacing ordinary derivatives by covariant derivatives. And one thing to remember is the inverse procedure is always well defined. That is, you can always start with the gauge theory and get to the global theory without gauge fields. You just set the gauge fields of the Lagrangian and the gauge couplings to zero and you're done. The problem is to go the other way. 
so uh, so this is okay so this is one issue um, so we're going to see or we're going to try and define this minima coupling principle and to do that we're going to have to have some well-defined notion of which operators are minimally coupled and which operators are not and you'll see that there's a problem with that there's another more basic problem in trying to classify operators in the effective theory based on whether they come from tree graphs or loop graphs and this is especially true in strongly coupled gauge theories and those are sort of the theories people are most interested in for studying the Higgs dynamics or something the analogs of QCD technicolor little Higgs models composite Higgs or whatever where the which are strongly coupled and again this is a rather basic fact so let me just show you what happens and then you'll see this again in chiral perturbation theory so let's take QCD which is strongly coupled and we know from the beta function equation that we get lambda QCD which is related to the coupling constant through this formula here lambda over mu is e to the minus 8 pi squared over g squared and now I put in the factor of h bar so that you can see what happens and we know that h bar counts loops so h bar to the 0 is tree h bar to the 1 is one loop etc and you can see from here trivially that lambda QCD is exponential in e to the minus 1 over h bar it's completely non-analytic in h bar the right hand side does not have a series expansion in h bar and you just cannot think of lambda QCD as tree level or a one loop formula or a two loop formula or anything it's just completely meaningless and that's why lambda QCD is referred to as a non-perturbative par parameter and in chiral perturbation theory the expansion com which comes in which is lambda chi or equivalently f phi are all proportional to lambda QCD and so there's no way that you can think of terms in the chiral Lagrangian as being somehow one loop terms or tree level terms or anything else in terms of the QCD theory and in fact I mean I've never heard anybody doing chiral perturbation theory even mention something remotely resembling this I mean it's been known I mean, nobody even talks about it because it's so obviously not true and this is true for any non perturbative theory because basically what happens is you get a formula very similar to this and uh, so composite Higgs models or technicolor are all going to not have any classification of the effective theory in terms of loop or tree effects in the full theory Now the caveat to this is that in weakly coupled theories you can do this but in some sense weakly coupled theories are not really what we're looking at the, a weakly coupled theory here would just be the standard model plus some, a few weakly coupled particles of the high scale and there's really no reason anymore to be doing that I mean we don't need these particles it's only if you have some kind of composite theory where the Higgs is dynamical where you're trying to explain the hierarchy problem that uh, you know the new physics effects are relevant at this point other points to note is that in effective field theories you can move terms around by using equations of motion or equivalently field redefinitions and when you do that you can generate f mu nu type terms and therefore things which you thought were tree or loop can be changed just by making field redefinitions <coughs> So there's no like fundamental classification of tree versus loop. And furthermore, even in weakly coupled theories, the classification depends on the nature of the underlying theory. So without knowing what the underlying theory is, you can't tell whether something is tree or loop. And a uh, example of this is just the standard model. So look at the weak interaction operator, the form Fermi operator. Uh, at uh, uh, so here's a u bar d s bar u so these are the from single w exchange and this has the form of current times current and so people think of current current operators as somehow being fundamental and coming from tree level exchange of a vector boson but there's a very similar current current operator which is delta s equals two which looks just like the one above and you might if you were just looking at current current forms and thinking it's tree level then both of these would have would be very similar but whether the bottom operator is tree level or not depends on the theory that is in the standard model because of the gym mechanism it first is induced at one loop level at second order weak but if the standard model didn't have the gym mechanism 
and people considered that before we understood the decays, you know, the top weak decays and so on, then this very same operator would be induced at tree level. So there really does not seem to be any way to classify things without knowing what the original, you know, the effective, the more fundamental theory is. And okay. And furthermore, even though the above, these operators look like current current, it's not good to think about them as current current because they get renormalized. So if you thought of the weak interaction delta S equals one operator as the product of two currents and tried to compute, you would lose the delta I equals a half rule. So this is kind of um, well known. I mean, I, I, if you want a reference, it's in, I did some large end lectures where this is given as a problem. But the delta I equals half rule tells you that in K to two pi decays, there are two isospin amplitudes, A one half and A three halves, and the ratio is about 20. So this is the famous delta I equals a half enhancement. If you treat the operator, the weak operator as a product of currents, then the matrix element factors, and basically the I equals a half and I equals three halves are related by klebsch gordon coefficient, when in this case is square root of two. So even though the operator looks like the product of two currents, it really isn't because it's a renormalized operator and it can't be treated as the product of currents. Okay. So this was just this was just an aside on the uh, whether uh, you know whether you can classify operators in terms of tree or loop classification, and so now I want to get back to the minimal coupling example. And so let's just try and classify things based on minimal coupling. So I'm just considering some toy examples. So imagine a theory with a scalar with charge one, which is little phi, and, and charge zero, which is capital phi. And let's look at three possible operators, O1, O2, O3. If the gauge interactions are turned off, they turn into O1 twiddle, O2 twiddle, and O3 twiddle. So the idea is, can we construct one, two, and three from the twiddled operators by minimal coupling. So clearly, if you just replace little d by capital D, O1 twiddle turns into O1. But zero stays zero. So you don't get O2 and you don't get O3. However, I can write O2 twiddle in a very different form. It looks like phi dagger, the commutator of two derivatives. It's still zero because ordinary derivatives commute. But now, if I replace ordinary derivatives by covariant derivatives, then the new version of O2 gives back the original one. So this principle of minimal coupling is ambiguous just because ordinary derivatives commute, and I can write them in any order and not know how the original operator, you know, when I gauge it, I get different results. You can't do this for O3. For O3 and the reason is an important point which I mentioned earlier, which is covariant derivatives aren't just abstract things sitting in space. They have built into them a charge, which is the charge of the field in which it acts. So you should always think of this covariant derivative as acting on a certain field. And the action on the field gives me back the charge of the field. So on capital Phi, which is neutral, covariant and ordinary derivatives are identical. And therefore, I can't, I can't, if I write something like this O2 twiddle for O3 and I gauge it, well, gauging it just leaves little d as capital D that's identical and I still stay with zero. So how do you want to define minimal coupling? So there's different ways. So if you want to use minimal coupling to classify operators, you would claim from the previous transparency that O1 is minimally coupled, O2 and O3 are not, so the coefficients C2 and C3 should be in codes what are called loop suppressed and down by 16 pi squared relative to O1 and O2. If you're allowed to include stuff like this with the little derivatives on there, then you would conclude that C1 is loops is tree and C2 is tree, but C3 is loop suppressed. So depending on exactly how you define minimal coupling, you get different results. And so one way to think about it is just say, uh, well, minimal coupling means that I take the operator in its naive form, so in, in the form over here and gauge it. 
the other option could be you're allowed sorry you're allowed to try all possible trickeries with little derivatives to see what happens and so one way to think about this is that okay minimal coupling means terms with just field strength tensors are suppressed so that would be like the first definition and you could define something which we call next to minimal coupling which says you're allowed to play around with little derivatives in all possible ways but that would tell you terms with f mu nu and neutral fields are suppressed because for neutral fields as I pointed out, this little derivatives and covariant derivatives are the same. But it turns, I mean, neither of these actually works, as you see. Um, a generalization to the non abelian case is, is the following. So if I consider some field phi and say, this is a QCD, you can have an operator like, so suppose phi were color triplets or something, you can have an operator like phi dagger g mu nu squared phi. And you can have an operator like phi dagger phi trace g mu nu squared. So these are two different invariant ways of cu coupling the color indices. And neither can be generated by minimal coupling because when you set the field strength to zero, they both vanish. But if you try it next to minimal coupling, which is playing around with derivatives, you can generate O4. But you can't generate O5, even though it looks very similar. And the reason is that covariant derivatives do not change the representation property of the field on which they act. So if, if a covariant derivative acts on a color triplet, it's going to stay a color triplet. And if you play around with it, you'll see that here, the, the phi dagger phi is separately gauge invariant from the trace g mu nu squared, and you can't get it by playing around with ordinary derivatives like this. Because the object that you're going to act with, with ordinary derivatives, is going to be phi dagger phi, which is color singlet. So anyway, so there are certain operators which, you know, just looking at these, these there doesn't seem to be much difference between the two, but nevertheless, by the minimal coupling method would tell you that O5 should have a 1 over 16 pi squared suppress coefficient relative to O4. Now, let's first back up a second and ask why you might think that minimal coupling is even useful. And the answer is that if you look at, say, the standard model, or you look at um, at, uh, at uh, sorry, yeah, somebody. Pilar, go up. ahead. Pilar. Yeah, you want yeah, to know the classification. So the. So the So the okay. Um, so we've tried to get okay. So I I have not been we have not been able to extract out of them a precise definition where I could put it on a piece of paper, let's say, and. An independent per, a bunch of independent people reading the paper would come up with the same answer as to which operators are suppressed and which operators are not. But I think at this point, the basic version that they're using is this other the statement I have here, which is that terms with F mu nu and neutral fields are suppressed. So uh, but that's, the, that's part of the problem, which is I would like to have a definition where I do not have to email somebody to find out which operators are small and which operators are big. And uh, so let me, let me go on, and you'll see why none of the, it doesn't really make sense to me. So you'll see why. OK, um, Belen, you have a? Should I go on or is, should I wait for a question? She asked exactly what was their basis, what is the main difference, you know? Uh, I'll, sorry I'll for the my... Uh, let, let, me, let me go on. I mean, you'll, I mean, my main problem is I couldn't understand a word of what was being said because it, it makes no sense. And you, I hopefully I'll show you why it doesn't make any sense. So let me let me just keep going, and I'll show you what the basis is in a second. It's it's I think the, towards the very end. But let's see if you. I mean, I 
Let's see if you can even try and use minimal coupling to do anything. And so if you take like QED or QCD, what people do is they just take, you know, the normal fermion kinetic terms and boson kinetic terms and say, oh, look, you can get the QED or QCD Lagrangian by uh, using minimal coupling. But the reason you can do this for part of the standard model Lagrangian is that there's only a very limited set of operators that we have with dimension up to four. And even in this limited case, it's not true because if you look at the full Lagrangian, people are forgetting the fact that you have a gauge kinetic term and you have the theta term. And both of these are not what would be called not minimally coupled. And furthermore, you might say, aha, look, but GG dual has a 1 over 32 pi squared factor. It's loop suppressed. But we all know that the effects of the theta angle are order one. The effect of it's g squared over 16 pi, or g squared over 32 pi squared gg dual when integrated is an integer because of instantons. So even in the standard case, the kinetic term, it's, it's the theory looks minimally coupled only if you forget to look at the gauge kinetic term because with it, it's not. Now, if you start to do higher dimension operators, you can have things like the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron or higher order terms which have f mu nu. And you might say, aha, minimal coupling says that these terms shouldn't be there, and that's great because it agrees with experiment. But really, and this, this was noted a long, long time ago by, for example, you can read Weinberg's summer school lectures where he's discussing exactly this point in 1970. What he shows is, that really the reason we do this is renormalizability. That is, we think of QED as a fundamental theory with the high scale lambda essentially being infinite. And power counting tells you this operator should be suppressed by one over lambda. And if we make lambda very large, then we can drop the anomalous magnetic moment. But if we assume there's some high scale, uh, the scale lambda isn't that high, then you, sh you should include operators like this. And so, let me go through some examples of why you can see that you know, minimal coupling doesn't make sense. And we can start with just the fact that it doesn't make sense as a definition, because if you go to just non-relativistic quantum mechanics and take the Hamiltonian for a spin S particle, it's P squared over 2M times a unit matrix in spin space, and when you gauge it, you get the standard ha ha uh, Hamiltonian for a charged particle in a magnetic field, which is given by the formula here, P minus QEA squared plus the phi zero term. Interaction, but you don't get the magnetic moment interaction of the electron. And a couple of textbooks that I've seen say, OK, we're going to get the electron interaction by taking exactly this Hamiltonian, but writing it in a slightly different form. I'm going to write it as sigma dot p squared over 2m. And I want to emphasize this is absolutely identical to the first version. Because when you square the Pauli matrices with sigma dot p as the operator, you get exactly the same Hamiltonian. So there's no difference. But if I gauge it, and so write it in the sigma dot p form, but now replace the p by a covariant derivative and expand out, I get the original term here, but I also get a magnetic moment interaction. So two absolutely identical Hamiltonians, depending on how you do minimal, how you introduce the covariant derivative, give you two different results. They differ by magnetic moment interaction, and remember that the difference is order one. Okay, there's no loop suppression or anything within quantum mechanics. There's no, there are no loops. And once again, the ambiguity is related to the fact that ordinary derivatives and covariant derivatives don't commute. So if you go back here and think about what's happening, the difference between writing sigma dot pi squared and sigma dot and just pi squared, which is the above form, is related to the fact that Pauli matrices don't commute. So you're effectively introducing a, a sigma mu nu f mu nu term through the fact that covariant derivatives don't commute. And the difference is just there's no tree or loop or anything. It's just an order one effect having to do with operator algebra. And actually, uh, this was realized. So somebody sent us an email saying people already knew this in 1950. And so Herman Weil in 1950 
as a paper where he's looking at electrons and gravity plus electromagnetism. And in gravity, you can use either a first or second order formalism. That is, you can either treat the spin connection and Feyerbein as independent and solve the two equations of motion, or you can treat the spin connection as a function of the Feyerbein, plug that in and vary. And depending on which one you use, you get two different equations of motion which differ by an F mu new term. And it's again related to this. There's no unique operator ordering. Ordinary derivatives commute, and different ways of doing exactly the same calculation will re lead to results which are equal. Well, but when you plug in covariant derivatives, you can get different results depending on exactly what you do. So, so there is no well-defined minimal coupling formal, uh, formula. That is, different people doing what looks like identical things will end up with results which differ by order one just because covariant derivatives don't commute. Okay. Now, for the electron case, Neither of the two Hamiltonians I told you is actually correct because the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron comes in and the magnetic moment is one plus alpha over two pi. So the magnetic moment term here, oops, here uh, should have a coefficient which is one plus, which is a, which is one plus alpha over two pi plus whatever. But you might say, okay, it doesn't really matter that alpha over two pi is like a loop factor and therefore everything's fine. But this isn't you can go to a different particle, which is the proton. And now, depending on the two ways of doing non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the co I have to add an anomalous magnetic moment term, and the magnetic moment of the proton is 2.793. So the first way of doing things where I don't get a magnetic moment, I need to add a magnetic moment term with a coefficient 2.793. This is not minimally coupled. It's, it's big. It's not 1 over 150. If I do it the other way, I get 1 in the Hamiltonian, but I still need the 1.793 part, which is also big. So either method has a magnetic moment term, which isn't loop suppressed. And if you say, OK, for charged particles, I'm allowed to add sigma mu nu f mu nu terms, then you can go to the neutron. And the neutron is neutral. And therefore, covariant derivatives and ordinary derivatives are the same. And so the entire magnetic moment is non minimally coupled, and it's minus 1.91. And that's also big. And furthermore, we know from QCD that the proton and the neutron are very closely related to each other. And in fact, with Elizabeth, I proved a long time ago that in the large n limit, you can show that the ratio of magnetic moments is minus 2 thirds exactly in the large n limit, plus corrections which go like 1 over nc squared. And this is very close to the experimental result. Now, minimal coupling would tell you that the neutron's neutral and the proton has charge one, and this ratio should be zero. So, I mean, the whole concept of minimal coupling in this case is ridiculous because you would say that the neutron magnetic moment is 16 pi squared suppressed and the proton's not, but they're related by isospin. So it, it doesn't really. Uh, anyway, so here's an explicit example which shows you that, you know, this ratio is is not a loop factor, okay? It's just some clutch gordon coefficient of two-thirds. You can look at other neutral particles, such as the hydrogen atom. And if you look at the hydrogen atom in an electric field, it has a coupling, it has an electric polarizability, and that polarizability, you, you know, it's a famous calculation in quantum mechanics, is just given by the size of the atom, the Bohr radius squared, cubed. And you can look at the atomic transitions, the 2 s uh, the 2 p to 1 s transition, et cetera. And even though the hydrogen atom is neutral, it couples to the electric and magnetic fields. It couples to the F mu nu. And the power counting parameter is 1 over the size of the atom. And there's no loop factors or anything else. And there's an effective field theory which does this. I'm kind of running low on time. So let's, let me just quickly go through a few of the other points. So in chiral perturbation theory, you can look at Tony Peake's review. The L4 Lagrangian has a whole bunch of terms. Some of them have covariant derivatives you might say are minimally coupled. Others have F mu nu, which you might think are not. But L10 actually is, in fact, one of the biggest coefficients of this order in the Lagrangian. Uh, and if you write the chiral Lagrangian and look at what the power counting says, uh, it has the following structure. The Lagrangian is an expansion in lambda chi. Uh, 
and the overall coefficient is lambda to the fourth over 16 pi squared. And there's no way to think of terms in here as tree or loop or anything else. You just do the Lagrangian. It's an expansion in powers of p. And these L's coefficients can't be fine-tuned to be, say, minimally coupled and 100 times smaller than others because there's a renormalization group equation. The L4 coefficients run, and the anomalous dimensions are all the same, basically. There's no suppression of the anomalous dimension of L10 relative to L1 or L2 or anything else. Another related thing in, in little Higgs models, which is kind of relevant here, is that we know that op, a, a graph like this produces the pi plus pi zero mass difference. So this is a pan and this is an electromagnetic interaction. And in the chiral Lagrangian, it corresponds to an operator like that. If you split open the loop, you get a two pi on f mu nu squared operator, which is just the L10 I mentioned earlier. Now, the reason this is relevant is that in little Higgs models, you assume that the Higgs is a pseudo Goldstone boson, which gets its mass through diagrams exactly like this, through weakly gauging the flavor symmetry. But if you assume the Higgs mass is given by a term like this, that is, you generate an H dagger H operator, then as soon as you cut open the gauge boson line, you automatically generate the Higgs gauge operators that we're talking about, H dagger H F, F mu nu squared. And so on very general grounds, any pseudo Goldstone boson Higgs model is going to have the analogs of L10 operators. And the reason people sort of miss this is they start with the L2, the leading order term in the chiral Lagrangian, and there's always plus dot dot dots, but if you ignore, or ignore the pl plus dot dot dots and just look at the first term and pretend that's all you have, then you don't see this. But this is just an effective theory, just like chiral perturbation theory, and these terms are there. Okay, so here are the operators they write down. So these are the operators we used, which were H dagger H, B squared, W squared, and WB, and those are the ones in the basis I showed you in the first or second transparency. And the claim is that instead of using these three operators, you should use OBB and four other operators. I don't know why four others, but because we, there were only three to start with. And these things have... Uh, covariant derivatives and so on, and there's a linear relation on the bottom two lines which allows you to convert between one basis and another. And the only thing I'll point out here is that two of these operators, the PW and the PB, have derivatives of W mu nu and B mu nu on them. And this is the same structure as penguin operators in the weak interactions, and usually what people do in the weak interactions is when we have operators like this, you use the gauge field equations of motion to get rid of them. But for some reason, they want to use this particular set of operators. And I, I don't see why, um, why, you should, why you have to do that. Because, I mean, we know from HQET and chiral perturbation theory, et cetera, that there's nothing wrong with picking any one linear, uh, any independent set of operators and doing the calculation. Uh, finally, um, um, one, another argument which has been used to for, for these operators is that you should think of the strongly coupled theory as just a, a theory which generates one light rho meson which you can integrate out. But that's also not true. So for example, if you look at large NQCD where we have some control, you get an infinite tower of meson states with particles of arbitrarily high spin. And people have looked at the role of resonances in, in fact, that's the title of this paper, The Role of Resonances in Chiral Perturbation Theory and How You Generate the Chiral Lagrangian from Integrating Things Out. And we know that you need, first of all, an infinite number of meson states because the correlation functions in QCD have anomalous dimensions and log Q squared behavior, and you can't get that through a sum over finite number of mesons. Witten, in fact, pointed that out a long time ago. And in QCD, you have operators with arbitrarily high spin, such as the twist two operators of deep and elastic scattering, and to saturate those Green's functions, you're going to need particles of arbitrarily high spin. So it's just not true that QCD or any strongly interacting theory behaves just like pions plus a rho meson. It's, you know, this was some vector dominance idea from like 1965, but it's certainly not good enough to explain all the behavior of the strong interactions that we know about. And it's certainly not true that 
This is the dominant effect, and all effect, other effects are suppressed by some loop factor of, six, of you know, 16 pi squared, which is 150. So uh, this is just, um, I mean, it, it's, it's not really valid. And certainly it's not, I mean, you can't assume it in a theory where you don't understand the dynamics yet. Uh, another thing which is done is sometimes what's said in the papers is, oh, we'll just assume that the UV theory is such that the low energy theory is minimally coupled. And if you read this, it's like saying, okay, I'm going to assume CP so that the effective theory has CP in it. And it looks very plausible. But CP is a symmetry. It leads to constraints on award identities, which then can be used in the effective theory. Minimal coupling, and Weinberg already pointed this out in his 1970 lectures, does not have any consequences for ward identities. And so you can't do that. And a, a, a trivial example is quantum mechanics. So suppose you consider an arbitrary potential V of X for the hydrogen atom. What do you mean by constructing an effective theory which is minimally coupled? So V of X is like the UV theory. We know the full potential. Saying that V of X is adjusted to produce minimally, minimal coupling is like saying that we're going to construct hydrogen atom-like states and all the bound states don't couple to the electromagnetic field. And that's just not possible. And one trivial way to see this is there's a famous oscillator strength sum rule in quantum mechanics which says that the sum of the squares of the matrix elements over all states add up to one. You just can't set them all to zero. So even though this sounds innocuous, you're really making very strong assumptions about the dynamics of the theory. And in fact, it's, it seems to be just contradictory. And so a very basic point, I think, is you just can't assume minimal coupling in the effective theory because the full theory has a very few parameters. It has dynamics you can't adjust. So for example, in QCD, you have the quark masses and the gauge field, but you can't arbitrarily change the interactions of the pi zero or other neutral particles. Everything is tied to everything else. And uh, so, um, uh, so it sounds like assuming minimal coupling is like assuming some symmetry, but it isn't a symmetry and you can't assume it. Somehow, OK, that's good. This is the end, even though it says 46 out of 48. So I'm done. And if you guys have questions. Go ahead. Questions, please. Pilar? I've asked it for the... Uh. Okay. okay, so... Question. Repeat the question. Okay, so there's two aspects to this. One is this Higgs analysis that we were talking about. So, so on this transparency, the claim is that if you use this basis, you're going to find that miraculously all the, here, let's go back here. So somehow, miraculously, when you calculate these, these, these um, runnings, the various pieces in here are all going to cancel each other out. Because, if you, because allegedly, uh, minimal coupling tells you that these coefficients should all be small, and therefore, all these various effects must end up canceling other, each other out. But they haven't act, I mean, even though they're making these claims, if you read that paper, they haven't actually calculated the anomalous dimension in the 5 by 5 basis. They're just making this statement without actually doing the calculation. So we'll see. 
but I certainly know examples like in chiral perturbation theory, other places where you know you don't get these cancellations. So I don't see why they should be there. The other place this comes in is in uh, various uh, the Silch model of strongly interacting Higgs, where by making this assumption, they're like getting they're looking at a very limited set of operators in their theory. And I don't know this model in detail. I just started looking at this recently because of the whole discussion on minimal coupling. But it's all over the place in that paper. And my guess is that the dynamics is it's not going to hold up if you don't if you drop the assumption. Uh, I, I mean, they're, they're making very strong statements about the dynamics of the theory which they're using. So we'll see. Okay. Marcel, please go ahead. You you have voice now, I think. Um, you uh, stated at the beginning that uh, this parametrization of the Higgs couplings is a very general effective theory. I, I can't hear you. Can you talk louder? Assuming extra states are heavy. I, I can't hear you. Can you talk louder? You said at the beginning that. Uh, you are parameterizing general Higgs couplings in general theory, assuming extra states are heavy. But it is enough to add an extra Higgs doublet, and the whole parametrization falls into pieces. Do you agree with that? So, uh, so uh, couldn't quite hear, but what we're assuming is essentially hear, that what we're assuming is essentially that. Sorry, I'm getting a big echo here. Sorry, but I'm the, getting a big echo here. But the uh, what I'm assuming is that the standard uh, model is actually the standard is, model actually is a, a, a good description a, a, at the electroweak scale, and that the new physics is is given by some some new dynamics at a TV. So even if the standard model the Higgs was like a composite, uh, it, you could do something like this. Like in Carl perturbation theory, you have a pion and you, you, know, you have other states and you write down um, some effective Lagrangian involving the pion. So we're doing something analogous to that. People have written down models, uh, theories. I think Galen worked on this recently where you Put in the put old in stone modes, which, which are eaten plus the Higgs, plus and write down and write the effective down the theory. theory. Anish, I think they were asking, um, somebody on say I didn't recognize the voice, is asking, um, what happens if you have more than one Higgs in the theory, if the whole discussion oh, oh. falls apart? I think that was the question. If the other doublet is light, then you have to start, the starting point has to include the second Higgs doublet and you have to redo the analysis with more, and there will be more parameters. That's correct. So the two Higgs doublet model with a light second Higgs doublet would not fit. Um, and you would have to um, redo, redo everything, including that second Higgs doublet. If the second Higgs doublet was heavy of, say, 800 GeV, then you could do it this way. But not if it's a 200 GV or whatever. And Valencia, if they are happy, clear up your hand, and I give the word to somebody in Madrid. Or say, are you okay? Okay. Herrero in Madrid wants to ask. Just a minute, Maria Jose. Just a minute. Let me let me find you here, Madrid. Give voice. So. Maria Jose, now you can talk and put the video if you wish, etc. You can ask Herrero, please go ahead.
Uh, the people in Madrid, can they hear me? Herrero wanted to ask a question, but we are not listening to her. Can you? You want to lend somebody else to ask a question who can talk while she's typing, or, or maybe she's online now. Somebody else, Maria Jose, you can talk. Why don't you talk on the on the microphone? Okay, let me take her off the privilege and see if she writes. She's typing. It seems she's speaking. Who is she speaking? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay, Maria okay. Jose is now. Ah, Maria Jose is now there. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Maria Jose. Uh, louder, please. Louder. Can you listen me? Hello? Anish, do you hear her? No, I can't hear anything. So if, if, if you can hear her, then just repeat the question. No, very bad, Maria Jose. Write it, write it down, and I give the word to Orse in the middle. Can you write it? Is she writing? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So uh, I will try. Okay, I will give the voice to Orse in the, in the meantime. You keep sure. writing. Okay, so let me go to Orse. Where is Orse? Wait, wait. Back here. Orse. This is Orse, I think. Give voice. Yes. Orse, please go ahead. Now they say that they, they already asked them. They ah. ah, okay. So please clear your status, clear your hand. But what is she writing? Damn it. Ah, yeah. But it could, it could send an, an email. It would be easier. I don't know why do we don't hear Madrid. Yeah, but something is the problem of Madrid, I think. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's some technical problem in Madrid or something. Madrid is typing. Maria Jose, start sending. <coughs> ah, very good. Thank you. Okay, so, okay, the question is whether the ambiguities can be minimized if one looks for RG invariance and in effective theories. So, I think, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, is I think, a lot stronger, which is that this. Issue, this minimal coupling, I don't know where it came up from because at least I never heard it being used ever until recently, which recently meaning a month ago. So, you know, when I was taking classes on field theory and so on from George, I, I mean, he never mentioned this thing. And there's good reason for it. So people working on HQET never used it or chiral perturbation theory. And it's because it doesn't it doesn't make sense as far as I can tell as it's not a it's not a principle it's not nothing it was it's what people do when they teach quantum mechanics because they don't want to discuss gauge invariance and uh, I don't I don't see any way to make sense of it I mean it would be great if you could have some other thing you could do which would limit the terms in your effective theory or make, you know, so that you have less coefficients and operators to worry about. But I don't see how to, 
how to do that. And uh, so in HQBT, for example, these some of these terms which you might think are minimally have F mean use in it, you can get by field redefinitions. And so there's no fundamental reason why a term like that should be small. And uh, so, I mean, at this point, I would just say it, it doesn't make any sense, I mean, at, at all as a classifying principle. And really people, I mean, Weinberg and people knew this I mean, 50 years ago or something. So it's somehow been uh, resurrected recently for mysterious reasons. Any other question? Okay, any other? Any other? I have a a question. Can yeah. you put yeah. Can you put the set of uh, of invariants, your basis there, or their basis, the transparency with their basis? You don't mean the fifty nine. You mean the other? No, no, the small, the subset of three versus four or five. And there. No? This one. This one. Oops. There. there. Okay, so right. is this correct? If I understand what they claim is that if you would do a mediator analysis of their basis, so assuming we coupling, all yeah, yeah. the operators they take would emerge by three level exchange of some particle, while part of the basis you use it wouldn't. Uh, that's what that's what they're uh -huh. right, because right. they assume now, weak now, coupling, because if this is because they are assuming they have in their heads a certain ultraviolet comp completion in weak coupling, right? Which is weak, Which is weak coupling, coupling and renormalizable. Re yes. Yes. Okay. okay. And so, so this is the third paper on the list. Balan, maybe you could turn off the, some, the some mic if they're going. Okay, so the third paper on the list, I constructed an exactly soluble large N model where, in fact, you of a particle, and that's because there's a particle which couples to W mu nu squared, just phi W mu nu squared, and normally you would say, oh, that's dimension five and not renormalizable, but my theory is completely renormalizable. It's a lambda phi fourth theory. And this phi particle is generated as a composite through the standard mechanism for the ON model that, say, Coleman has in his lectures. It's a simple, it's a trivial generalization of what Coleman did in his large N lectures. And I can generate, in large N, I generate, in fact, exactly these operators and all the other operators are suppressed by powers of 1 over m. So it's like a counterexample to what they're saying. I think if you assume a very limited sort of dynamics, you can maybe get this. But we don't know what the UV theory is. So I don't see why we should bother with that. I mean, we're trying to do a model independent analysis to see what's there. If I know what's there, I don't need to look at experiments. I already know it. I think it was very beautiful uh, talk and very interesting. It is a pity the, the, that group is not present, but just after starting, I realized they are not in any node of invisibles. Nevertheless, the talk remains in our web page, the video of the talk. So we could have thought of inviting them. But if they ever give a seminar, we will tell you so that you can be simultaneously present if you wish. Okay. 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 That's, so, that's... Uh, it's, uh, we could have said to them, but I didn't think of it. So, if nobody else, I see a hand raise in Madrid, but I think this is just because um, they left their status non clear. So, um, if uh, I think we can thank very much Anish and Elizabeth for their effort getting up so early and for this uh, very interesting physics presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody in the lab. So goodbye, Anish and Elizabeth. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Goodbye.
Okay, okay, we'll shut down. Bye. ¿Cómo se cierra?